Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's LF networking webinar. Our topic today is Orange deploys ONAP in production. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items before we get into introductions. Um, all of the material shared today, the slides and a link to the recording will be available to anyone who's registered for this webinar. Uh, in the coming days, it will be emailed to you along with a one page detailed asset about the topic as well. Um, that's gonna be available online today and that will also be emailed to registrations, registrants. And then we'd also like to note that um, in progress is a longer form case study uh, that will be available within the next few weeks that goes, to, goes into even more detail. Um, that being said, uh, for today's webinar, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to click on the Q&A tab in the bottom right of your screen and type your question at any time. Uh, we should have time for live questions uh, towards the end of today's session. Uh, we do have panelists who are also happy to type in responses in real time in the Q&A tab. All right, uh, let's go ahead and kick off our introductions. We can go to the next slide, please. All right, so speaking with us today is Olivier Ogizu. Um, he is with Orange Innovation Network Automation Product Project Manager. We have Mohammed Hassan. He is with Orange Egypt. He runs the Telco Cloud Engineering and Automation as a senior manager. And then our other two speakers. If we can click to the next slide. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, sorry. Uh, we've got Abdel Muhammad Saudi. Um, he's the head of B2B solutions for Orange Innovation in Egypt. And we have Mohammed Daoud, also with Orange Egypt, Telco Cloud, NFV, DevOps integration. All right, uh, I'm going to go ahead and kick it off to Olivier, uh, who's going to get us started with today's discussion. OK, thank you. So welcome. And uh, so we are going to, to present you, in fact, uh, what we did using uh, Orange uh, to, to match uh, the transport uh, network automation. So uh, we had uh, several challenges to face when, if we want to uh, automate our transport network infrastructures at, sc at scale. So the first one, and maybe one of the most important one, is to decouple the legacy uh, IT application from the network, because currently uh, we have strong adherences and uh, the network interfaces are hard coded in our IT. So this is a st uh, current strong impediment for more agility, TTM, and uh, effective cost reduction. The second challenge we have to face too is to unlock the vertical vendor silos with two uh, axes. The, the so, sorry to yes to, to this. The, the first one is the network element uh, management openness. So to bring more openness uh, to uh, each network element, uh, considering the, the on a global way the, 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 the transport infrastructure. So it can be the IP networks, but also the transmission networks, so the WDM, microwave, etc. And replace a vendor locked vertical management solution by open solution because more and more we need interoperability between in the different network domains. So we need a global view of our network um, uh, infrastructures. And then uh, the network automation has become a business continuity challenge because uh, we have less and less people uh, in our operational teams and the network operations are getting more and more complex. And we have also more uh, operations to, pe to perform, and we must enforce and ensure our operational processes, our operational uh, efficiency. So now uh, the question is not uh, do we need to automate or not, but how to perform the, this automation. So uh, we, well, if we talked about network automation, so it's a long journey. And uh, we have to take into account uh, where we are today and where we want to go tomorrow. So here you have a maturity evolution uh, um, scale 
uh, based on six levels, and these levels are inherited by the TM, by some uh, TM form uh, works. So in appendix, you will have the definition of, of all of these levels. So, but for the sake of the presentation, uh, I, I, I would try to explain. So the level zero, everything is done manually. So uh, it's, let's say, uh, the past, the legacy, legacy system. Level five, we have a global automation system fully aware about all the networking domains and implemented everywhere. So maybe it's a target we will never reach, but it's a, let's say, a long-term target. What is interesting is to focus on the intermediate levels. Levels. Level one, you have a assisted management. This is pieces of a technical automation performed in some a location of the network. So globally, the sit this is the situation today. With level two, we are starting to implement some uh, closed loops. We have uh, some uh, partially autonomous networks based on predefined events and predefined uh, rules and predefined actions. On level three, we have uh, for a specific networking domain, uh, more autonomy in the decision making and we can adapt the decision to the global uh, awareness of the network domain. In level four, we have this awareness on the multi-domain. Uh, let's say, for instance, uh, you, you can drive your IP uh, layer according uh, to some events, some awareness of the transmission uh, network, and we introduce uh, some uh, more predictivity. And this is important to, to see this. So of course, we are targeting level three or even le level four. But uh, as far as we are starting with level one, uh, there is a big difference in the automation journey because at level one, you can achieve your automation with standalone projects based on single use cases basis, selecting different solutions for each use case. And with this, you have no guarantee to, to to be able to evolve to a higher level, because when you target uh, automation from level three, this requires a global automation approach because you have uh, this uh, awareness requirement of your uh, networking infrastructure. So uh, we need to have a disruptive transformation and to, um, to drive this transformation, we need uh, not a theoretical framework, but uh, I, I need, uh, uh, at least we need some concepts and functional architecture and so on. So our vision is target is that we must bring IT and network together to drive this transformation. And we must move from a closed IT architecture to an open platform, one accessible with open uh, API. So it's our chairman, uh, and CEO who, who said this. And we have uh, selected the TM Forum Open Digital Architecture as a global framework to support this transformation. And in a nutshell, in a chat, sorry, if you are not uh, familiar with the Open Digital Architecture, the target is to, to transform the vertical and mon monolithic applications into modular components organized in a horizontal layers. So today we have, for instance, the billing system, the provisioning system, the service assurance system, etc., that are vertical applications. And the idea is to bring this into uh, some horizontal uh, blocks. So the party management deals with uh, the who. Uh, so uh, the who can be the customers, the partners, the providers, the core commerce. Uh, block deals with the what, so the products and uh, the offers we are selling to our customers and the produ production blocks deal how to implement uh, this into uh, factories, into network factories. So the production block is a really a key component for the network uh, automation. And now the question is how can we implement this production block? So open source is a corner, will be the corner store of our transformation to build an open digital architecture compliant platform. And we have selected ONAP. So we have many use cases, but we must consolidate these use cases in a single environment to have 
this uh, multi-domain awareness we want to reach. So here, for instance, we do have the IP infrastructure, the microbe infrastructure, the optical infrastructure, the fixed access infrastructure. And you see we have different kinds of use cases such as 5G transport, CP management, service provisioning in IP backbone, IP WDM convergence, optical uh, Cross domain end to end scenarios, service provisioning for micro, etc. And uh, we have selected uh, on app components uh, to build a common uh, automation framework. So, sharing the same infrastructure, sharing the same uh, technical enablers, and adding uh, at the south band of uh, on app some domain specific components such as the open daylight uh, sdn controller ansible playbooks uh, the cisco nso solution and we can add in the future uh, other vendor uh, solutions so uh, now uh, to to go into production of course starting from the open source uh, on app uh, distribution we have to package it uh, so uh, what is the on app packaging by Orange. So we have selected uh, some components from the ONAP platform. We have added them uh, to, to answer uh, the transport network automation. So we have started with prototyping uh, activities based on the real use cases. So involving uh, IP configuration changes so performed by Cisco and ESO and Ansible. And we have uh, worked on the integration of these components uh, into ONAP. Uh, we have selected also, we have made a design of the global architecture to, to select the mandatory components from the ONAP. But we also want to have a modular design because uh, in the Orange Group, we are operating in uh, 26 uh, countries with different situations, different kinds of networks. And and the requirements uh, at the uh, deployment day is not exactly the same in each network in each country. So uh, we had also some uh, strong requirements. So the platform must be installed offline. So without any internet connectivity in Orange Country's data center. Why? Because uh, these uh, data centers are very sen sensitive. They are hosting our network management applications and we cannot have a plain uh, internet access. So we, this is very important to have this offline uh, installation uh, managed in a CICD way. CICD way, sorry. So today uh, we have a distribution of the uh, enabling zero touch installation on bare metal servers, and uh, we are working uh, to perform the, this to, to have a flexible uh, infrastructure. So from bare metal, VM, or a container as, as a service. What also we intend uh, with uh, hardening is to work on security, to remove all the default password, uh, to and uh, to, to improve, in fact, all the operations of these uh, components, such as uh, uh, logs, monitoring, backup restore. And uh, next year, we plan also to work on the upgrade. Uh, wh when you have lots of data in your components, you want to upgrade from uh, one version of ONAP to another version. You, we must be aware of, uh, able to upgrade, sorry, keeping all the data, of course, the operational data uh, we already have. And what is important is we do not want to fork from ONAP. So um, we uh, each time we modify something, we upstream uh, it to, uh, the, to the community. And our packaging, uh, we intend to have uh, lots of tests running. So we are reusing the community test. We have specific tests dedicated to the orange situation. And our target is that when, uh, when we have uh, a new version of uh, ONAP, uh, we have uh, our orange packaging available within two or three weeks uh, after the official release. Uh, the functional architecture in a nutshell, so it, it is a simplified functional architecture. In the reality, it's more complex, but uh, at, on, at the North Bond, we have a customer facing services APIs uh, that are consumed by external uh, applications or graphical user interfaces, uh, if it is the case. 
we have a first level that focused on the uh, operational processes. Uh, and if we reference to the TM forum, uh, open digital architecture, it is, it, it, this is the sum uh, functions so of service order management. You, with order, uh, you have to take care to understand order on a generic way. It's not uh, only commercial order, but it can, it can be any uh, kind of working order uh, that can be sent to a network factory, for instance, to upgrade the capacity of the network, to upgrade the uh, network element in uh, the, the, the firmware of a network element in the network or whatever you, the, the order uh, name is quite generic. Then we have a resource order management function, so a ROM function that is focused on the technical orchestration. Then we have a network mediation layer. So the target of the network mediation layer is to abstract the uh, network specificities or the vendor uh, specificities to uh, the room, okay? And uh, we have a single source of trust. So it's very important uh, when, if we are uh, going toward this automation journey, the network is no more the source of trust, but it is the service and resource inventory that now uh, will be uh, the source of trust. And here we uh, model uh, or we represent all the intents we want to uh, deploy in the network and we link the resources, so the service resources with the network resources with several uh, levels of, uh, of things. So what are the uh, ONAP component used to perform uh, this? We have, uh, so the, the color codes are, are the same. So at the same level, we have the service orchestrator that acts as a service order management function. So today we had to implement some orange specific workflows or pieces of workflows. And uh, of course, uh, the target would be to try to generalize this and to uh, propose this uh, workflow extension or workflow, new, new workflow pieces to, to upstream to get them uh, uh, upstream uh, to the community. We are using uh, the, the CDS, so the CDS is the controller design studio, and the CDS is acting as a ROM, so a resource order management function, so a kind of technical orchestration, while the SO is more a business or operational oriented orchestration. The active and available inventory is a masterpiece of uh, our distribution because it's the single source of trust and here uh, we represent the service and resource inventory. So today uh, we had to add some specific schema extension to this database. And of course, it's something we would like to propose as upstream to the community once we are sure about uh, how to generate this and because we don't want to, to upstream something too specific to, to Orange. So we have replaced the SDNC by a standard distribution of open daylight because we wanted to be flexible on the open daylight uh, distribution uh, we, we have, that we, we are using uh, an, uh, the, the open source distribution of, uh, of open daylight. And uh, this uh, open daylight is here to uh, integrate some network uh, mediation components that have a net config interface. So it, this is the case, for instance, of the of the shelf uh, Cisco NSO uh, solution that is a conf uh, IP configuration uh, uh, manager. So why we have replaced the SDNC? So uh, as I told, it's to uh, is to be able to 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 select uh, any uh, open data distribution and to have more flexibility on other version and patches, uh, not to wait to have them integrated in the SDNC. And at this stage. We do not need the specific functions uh, of the SDNC, such as, such as DigiGraph or VNF specific uh, function for the kind of use cases uh, we are uh, deploying uh, today. And what is very important, uh, last point, is that we have a clear split between the business orchestration at the ASO some function and the technical orchestration. And we just need to ex exchange some unique ID uh, stored in the active enable enable inventory between the layers, whatever is the use case. So we are we have totally standardized the interface uh, between the SO and the CDS for any kind of use case. So we think it's a great uh, improvement. So I let the floor to Mohamed Hassan to describe uh, the Orange YouTube journey. 
Hi everyone, this is Mohammed Hassan, and uh, this slide uh, I like to call it ONAV and orchestration success cheat sheet. So there is a normal way to say it, and there is an interesting way to say it. So all of this uh, slide talking about how to be successful in deploying the ONAV and orchestration in general so, and during uh, this journey. So I'm telling you our experience, what we found, what we will do uh, to make it happen again in another affiliate inside Orange. So first of all, as you know, that ONAB is not out of the box solution. It needs a lot of customization. Even you will not purchase or install uh, ONAB, you must install it to start learning from it. It's considered as a role model for the orchestrator. And you, will, if you installed in your uh, lab, you will learn a lot. A lot of 5G vendors will give you the, their orchestrators as a free of a charge uh, to be uh, including the package of the 5G, but also you will need uh, on app to, to, uh, to learn from it. So please, please uh, start to uh, install on app in your lab and start playing with it. If you finally uh, decided to go commercial uh, orchestrator, don't buy license, please buy a scope from them. For example, uh, zero touch provisioning for the new Mac and give it uh, 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 a duration, for example, three months or six. So by this way, you will have a successful implementation for orchestration. Most of the orchestration projects has, has, uh, uh, has no end and always to be extended and get delayed. Again, please, please, please don't buy license, buy a scope. So this is very important for anyone who's dealing or managing uh, an orchestration team or responsible about the orchestration. Uh, if your team is responsible about automation orchestration, please start with 100% of your manpower using the automation, uh, focusing on the automation projects and start most simple use and important use cases. After 10 use, uh, use cases of, uh, of automation, start thinking about orchestration. Starting with orchestration within the same time with automation uh, tasks will get uh, things more uh, fuzzy and very complicated. So start with automation. After a while, you will start with uh, orchestration. When you will start orchestration, divide your forces. Two thirds will be uh, of your manpower must focus on automation uh, cases and one third in orchestration. Automation team will face more non-technical issues, implementing operation team mindset in the code and let them accept the results. Customer satisfaction is very important. You must sit with the operation team and your product owners must daily sit with the operation team teams to let them accept the result and start using the tool. Orchestration team will start to face more technical issues, more than the, the automation to create multiple technologies and devices at the same time. Automation team must be uh, ahead of orchestration team. So as I told you before, uh, uh, he will pave the road for the orchestration guys. Try to complete your CI/CD both cycles, the code CI/CD and configuration CI/CD before uh, the orchestration phase. Make sure that the developers follow the code uh, disciplines. So uh, this is very important uh, to follow those steps. Uh, you must uh, uh, you must have a very good lab to test everything. Everything must be tested once and twice before uh, the deployment. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, uh, you must hire a good and uh, dedicated uh, testers for the code and the configurations and the scenarios. Try to develop good lab for your testing, as I told you before. Try uh, with engineering team to minimize the variety of devices of iOS. There is a huge iOS in there in. Uh, uh, types of variety, and this will make a, a lot of confusion and problems in the automation and orchestration. So try set with the engineering team and try to minimize the variety of uh, devices. Try to squeeze a little bit and shortlist uh, some devices. Uh, front end development. It's very important 
as back-end development. The user experience has a huge factor for project success and acceptance and let the guys use the tool. You can develop an ugly tool that no one will use it. So please spend some time with the front-end guys. Let's, the, you have good interface, interactive interface that can handle the need. If you don't have source of truth, please start one, uh, start to use one as soon as possible. There is a lot of uh, open source, uh, source of truth uh, in the market and uh, you have uh, uh, great products in open source and try to log everything, everything. That includes purchasing orders, purchasing uh, BO, BO numbers, end of support, end of live dates for all devices, log everything. Uh, and the last most important uh, recommendation for uh, from me to anyone uh, working there in the deployment of uh, orchestration, buy two large 60 inch screens and install them beside the CTO office and the CFO office and show on them how amount of savings that you gained uh, by deploying the automation orchestration. That is very important to get your budget approved. Thank you. And uh, I can pass to the next to Mohammed Dawood. Uh, thank you, Mohammed Hassan, for an interesting journey. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, now I will talk about uh, the, what is the change or enhancement that orchestration can do. Also, I will describe the, the difference between current status and orchestration uh, mindset and uh, mentality uh, related to automation opportunity. But to be able to do this, I need to take about a real use case in service provider. Uh, for us, uh, our use case is it is a layer three VPN in core MPLS network. Uh, but generally, uh, we generally work orders uh, over the uh, use cases uh, take some flow. So the current situation, we have some steps to deploy any uh, work order. The service owner, or as you can see in the slide, the service owner or customer can ask uh, or request a service, a new service. Maybe it, uh, it's a new or need to update something or delete the old service. So he can ask the engineering and the planning team, then uh, planning a team and engineering create work orders. Then forward the work order, so oper operation uh, uh, team, and the operation team can create and deploy, uh, sorry, deploy the work order. At the end, the service owner can test and validate the request. But sometimes we have uh, some uh, issues. So the customer, again, after validation and service owner of the validation and testing, maybe he's facing some problems. So he will report again engineering and the engineering will update some work orders and the operation, operation team will troubleshoot and uh, do uh, and uh, deploy the, uh, the updates. As you can see, it's a long, long, long journey to uh, without automation and without orchestration. It will take a lot of time of creation of communication and delivery. And also, uh, it, may, it may be have some uh, troubleshooting and errors. But actually, after our experience with uh, automation and orchestration, uh, the process will be uh, more easy in deployment. Any end-to-end -end service is like a predefined template. Some parameters come from customers and some parameters come from automated resource management. And this is the one benefits of orchestration. Uh, you, ha you have automated source management tool inside the orchestration itself. So the orchestration will provide uh, totally lifecycle management for any network service. That means we have service, service orchestration. And uh, also uh, it will provide a lot of accuracy because we will avoid human error and save a lot of time. Also, it will enhance user experience for management and deployment. And as you can see in the right side, this flow of the, uh, the creation of the work order, but in easy style by orchestration and automation. And we will go more deep in the next slide with Mr. Uh, Abdul Mahin Saud. Okay, thank you, uh, Mohammed. Uh, so uh, in this slide, we will uh, in this slide uh, uh, we will try to show a quick overview of the architecture used in the use case uh, with Orange Egypt. Uh, as you can see here, uh, this is a, 
an overview of uh, ONAP framework. And uh, beside it, we have also NSO. Uh, if we start uh, with the flow, uh, we have uh, first to design a workflow. And this will be agreed, of course, with the uh, operator in the use case uh, to see what is the use case we need to develop and what is the workflow that we will need to follow to uh, achieve end-to-end -end instantiation of a service instance. Uh, in this case, we designed this workflow and built it using Kamunda Modeler, as you can see, uh, so that it will run in the service orchestrator Kamunda BPMN execution engine. Uh, uh, also, we will have to design uh, a package in CDS, uh, Blueprint to Processor, to be used uh, to uh, carry out the different uh, technical steps needed to instantiate the service. Uh, as you can see here, uh, assuming that we are going to create a new service instance, we will have a customer uh, portal, a graphical user interface used uh, uh, by the ordering team or operations team uh, to uh, request a new service order. Uh, this portal will submit a REST API to SO API handler, which will run uh, the custom workflow designed by uh, Incamunda. Uh, this workflow will manage some of the basic elements uh, used in standard uh, ONAP workflows, like creating a service instance ID and in AI, <coughs> like uh, updating the service uh, request uh, ID and the service request status, so that uh, you have an idea about the service request. Is it now in progress or is it completed or is it failed? Uh, also, the ISO uh, Kamunda workflow will uh, create, uh, and, uh, will, uh, will use the AI as a, as a single source of truth uh, when uh, trying to synchronize the elements that will be uh, instantiated. Uh, then uh, the ISO will contact uh, CDS uh, using uh, REST uh, API to uh, deploy and run the Blueprint uh, package. Uh, this uh, CDS package will carry out different functions. One of them is communicate with AI if needed to pull some data or update some data. Also, uh, in case of automatic resource allocation, like the generation of a new IP address, subnet, or whatever, uh, CDS uh, can integrate with Netbox to pull out a new resource either an IP address or a VLAN or a VRF. Uh, also, we can communicate with Vault uh, to uh, retrieve uh, secrets that, uh, that are encrypted in Vault in case we are going to access systems like, for example, uh, Open Delight or maybe AWX or Ansible. Uh, we can use Vault to save some uh, sensitive passwords. Uh, and uh, finally, the CDS will uh, trigger the actual uh, request to SDNC or uh, Open Delight uh, using uh, REST or RESTConf, and then Open Delight will uh, contact NSO using NetConf to trigger the instantiation of a new configuration. This configuration, in our case, is a Layer 3 VPN VRF with a static root. Uh, subnet on the PECE uh, link, uh, root target, import, uh, and export, and so on. Uh, so this describes an end-to-end -end overview of the use case uh, from a technical point of view, and you can see the solution architecture. And there is also here in the, in the slide, as you can see, an opportunity also to use uh, Ansible, uh, which is also integrated with CDS, uh, part of the ONAP framework. Okay, thank you. So, thank you, Abdel. So, as a conclusion, uh, what we could say is that ONAP is suitable not only to prototype 5G use cases, but also to support transport infrastructure automation with the production target. And uh, I would say this is something very important. So maybe uh, because when you want only to, to be the proof of concept, you don't need the same reliability, stability uh, than in production, uh, but we found into uh, ONAP some components that are quite stable quite straightforward to, to use and very useful. So that's a 
very important, but we have to find a balance between uh, these mature use cases and components with more exploratory topics, because uh, when you deeper in production, you want everything to be to be stable, to have uh, no regression from the previous version, and you you need a stability. And your concern is are all the operational concerns that you can have, such as log management, memory consumption, CPUs con consumption, stability, etc., et and not. Uh, maybe um, new, too many new 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 features that that bring something that are not interesting your your uh, your use case. So uh, I guess that uh, today uh, we, there are few operators using uh, ONAP in production. But if we we are we are more and more to use ONAP in production, we will find a way in the community to 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 find the, this balance. And uh, also, uh, we have seen that uh, we have uh, used a specific workflows, or we had to adapt uh, some specific workflows. And using specific work workflows, we are not able to use the, some uh, design part uh, com components, such as the, the SDC, for instance, because the SDC is not compatible with the with the customized uh, workflows. So uh, and uh, I also men mentioned some um, schema extension to the active enabled ball inventory. So uh, we will have to find a way uh, to talk about this to the community to to reach the upstream effort uh, on this. But we didn't want to to do it uh, right now because uh, we are run running a lot and we do not pretend that the, the way we are doing it is the best way. So I guess the CCDPN uh, could be uh, the good place to talk about uh, all of this. And it's something that uh, we, we focus to, to do uh, next year. So thanks a lot for, uh, for attending uh, this webinar. And what we propose now is to open a session of questions and answers. Yeah, great. Thank you, Olivier. Thank you, everyone, uh, for this uh, this great information. Um, it does look like we have quite a few questions that have come in through both the chat and the Q and A window. <clears throat> um, so we'll just uh, get started with the the first one that came in from Carlos at eleven fourteen a.m. Um, he's asking, "What CAAS do you currently use? Is it all open source or a specific distro? Also, what is your solution for bare metal orchestration?" Okay, so uh, I will try to answer to, to this question. I'm not the best orange expert <laughs> to answer to this. So uh, in a nutshell, so the, the current deployment uh, has been deployed in uh, bar metal servers. So uh, my colleagues from Orange Egypt could uh, elaborate on this if uh, necessary. Uh, the CAS plan uh, is not uh, is in, is in the, the lab or in the process of, uh, of uh, building. Uh, at Orange, uh, for this kind of application, we are using our own uh, CAS based on some open source uh, solutions. But uh, the the global uh, and but we, we can have some differences uh, between one network and another network. So uh, I would say uh, this would be uh, studied uh, case by case according to the networking uh, to, to the networks where we would have to deploy it in a, in a case. Okay. Did did anyone else have any any of our panelists have anything else to add? Or are you good with Olivier's response? Yes, and regarding the bare metal orchestration, we didn't start this uh, phase yet. We still we are using step by step, as I told in my uh, slide. We started with uh, this uh, use case, and we start we build uh, over it. So we will not we will try, we will not try to get uh, to rush to cover everything from the beginning. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you. Next question is also from Carlos. Uh, can you clarify? You said don't buy a license, buy a scope. What do you mean by that? Uh, a lot of vendors who sell uh, the orchestrator, you will sell it with a license, number of license. If you have 100 device, you will sell, you will get 100 license and leave everything for you or 
you get someone else to the company to uh, to do the coding for you so uh, the best use case that we discovered if you will uh, uh, you want to orchestrate or automate thing uh, give it as a scope to the company or the vendor who sell you the uh, the software uh, to uh, orchestrate end to end, for example, zero touch version for the server, uh, for example, layer two, layer three VPN. It's the best way if you decided to to buy at a closed source uh, orchestrator. Great, thank you. Um, Roland is asking: uh, Do the integrations between SOM, ROM, and inventory follow Open API TMF standards? Okay, that's a very good question. So uh, I would say the target is yes, and uh, we will at this stage we rely on the current ONAP implementation. So we have uh, some good news: is that the, the service uh, order uh, API handler uh, is compatible with the TM forum uh, service order. So here we are compatible, of course the specific payload of your specific service is uh, women specific but all the wrappers and uh, of the of the request is standardized in the active and available inventory also you have the came from information model or pieces of this information model um, both for uh, service modeling and resource modeling and uh, yes, we will try to to go into this direction as far as possible. Yes, but I, I think uh, with the ONAP as it stands uh, today, uh, at least for SO and uh, ANAI, we have a very good basis to start with. Great, <clears throat> great, thank you. Um... Next question, uh, did you integrate just Cisco NSO or also some additional Cisco tools like IAP? Uh, okay, so uh, yes, we are using uh, AP in some uh, limited deployments, but in fact, uh, we have seen that the functions provided by IAP are redundant uh, with the functions provided by uh, NAP. So our target is really uh, to, uh, the, the, we see really the value in Cisco and ISO as the mid universal mediation layer uh, for to manage uh, configuration changes in IP routers. So uh, we really focus uh, on this. So, um, uh, so we have just integrated uh, Cisco and ESO as a Cisco tools. Uh, I've seen another question about uh, the, the interface. Was it simple or complicated to integrate? So I will try to, because it's related to, to try to answer this. So, uh, and if we had a collaboration with Cisco to perform this integration. So at the very beginning, yes, we had the collaboration with Cisco. Uh, in fact, we have seen that uh, there are several ways to to integrate uh, Cisco and ISO uh, into the ONAP uh, framework. First of all, in the top of Cisco and ISO, you have two kinds of interfaces. You have the NetConf interface and we have a REST API, a REST Conf API. And you can integrate in the several components. So you can integrate directly in the SO, you can directly integrate in the CDS, or you can directly integrate uh, to the SDN controller. And maybe you can find other ways. So we had different uh, proposals uh, from Cisco to, to work on this, but at the end, we have selected a way that we think that is the most generic uh, using uh, the NetConf interface, because if you use a NetConf interface, you, we do not have to, to wonder uh, if uh, one day uh, Cisco, because they have a major version, they change the, the REST API or whatever. And with NetConf uh, using a SDN controller, we can automatically uh, compile uh, at runtime the young models exposed by uh, Cisco and SO and have it available to be consumed in the uh, open daylight uh, SDN controller. So that's why we, we made this kind of integration at, at the end, uh, as far as we are talking about standardized protocols such as NetConf, Young and so on, 
the integration was, was quite uh, straightforward and uh, we had uh, nothing specific uh, to be expected uh, from Cisco to, to make this integration. Great, thank you for that. Um, moving along, uh, we've got someone asking, what were the selection criteria slash dynamics of Orange in selection of ONAP as an end-to-end -end orchestrator? Oh, that's a complicated uh, question because today we are talking about uh, transport networks. Uh, in fact, uh, we could talk about, so uh, yes, uh, there, there is a VNF deployment, 5G deployment. Uh, in some, also it depends on the operational situation of each country because we have different operational models. In uh, some countries, we are outsourcing the, the network operation. So in this case, it is more uh, a matter of subcontracting with the... Uh, with the company uh, operating the network. In other, uh, in other situation, we are operating by uh, our own resources, uh, everything. So uh, even if we just focus on uh, transport and uh, transmission uh, networks, it's uh, quite complex. So what all I can say is that for this kind of uh, scenarios, yes, we are promoting ONAP. For other uh, domains, uh, it's still uh, under assessment. And I cannot uh, give you uh, today uh, a definite position, let's say. No, that's, that's fair, thank you. Um, Mohammed would like to know, uh, do you use ONAP NBI for API integration? Do we use, sorry, ONAP NBI for API integration? Uh, I, I'm not pretty sure to, to have to understand the uh, question. And maybe I can, uh, no, we don't My, use. Uh... We don't use uh, MBI interface. We use uh, uh, REST call, service instantiation REST call to the ONAP service orchestrator uh, directly to uh, trigger the service creation request. Thank you. Um, what about deletion of service instance? I mean, how can you manage to release the IP address from NetBox subnet. Does CDS execute some additional workflow to release some parameters from NetBox, et cetera, while deletion of instance? Abdel, I think uh, you are the best one to answer this question. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, we have two uh, workflows in uh, CDS package. One to create resources and allocate them in uh, NetBox and update them in AI. And we have another workflow to delete the resource from uh, NetBox and uh, 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 free up the resource location in AI also. So, yes. Great, thank you. Um, how does CDS compose the CPE configuration and why doesn't NSO do this? Uh, if I may. Uh, 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 CDS does not compile the CPE configuration. Uh, the CPE configuration, or in our case, it's the PE actually for the layer three VPN uh, VRF use case. The, the configuration is actually a template uh, in NSO. So NSO is actually having the configuration template. CDS role is to uh, drive NSO to deploy the configuration and provide NSO with the necessary parameters for the configuration template in NSO. So actually the configuration template is in NSO. CDS uh, drives and provides parameters like IB addresses and VLANs and VRF names to NSO. Great, thank you. It looks and, like- And maybe, maybe sorry, uh, because the question was related to CPE because in the schema we are presenting CPE and uh, in the schema we have Ansible playbooks. 
So uh, in some situations, uh, we have, uh, in, in other situations than the Orange Egypt one, we also have a CP to, to be managed. And it's true that uh, it's directly the, the CDS in this case that is managing the Ansible playbook. And why uh, there is this difference is that uh, the configuration sensitivity is not the same if we are talking about a CP, P on a technical point of view in, uh, in PE, we need really a stateful uh, management of the configuration changes because we have many changes uh, in uh, PEs. So that's why uh, we need uh, a, the stateful engine provided by Cisco Inesso. For CPE, uh, once we have the initial configuration, uh, we have not so many uh, configuration changes and we, the CPE configuration is quite simple and we, have, we can have a stateless uh, configuration tool. Uh, this is what I mean. Uh, if we have the service description uh, we, uh, we, that is needed to be implemented in the CPE, this is enough to generate a full configuration of the CP. So that's why uh, Ansible uh, perfectly uh, fits this kind of uh, requirement. Great, thank you. These are really good questions. Um, I don't know if we're gonna have time to get to all of them, but we will uh, see how many we can get through. Uh, we are capturing them. So if we don't have time to get to your question, we'll see about potentially posting a Q&A uh, doc or a, a follow-up blog post. Um, it looks like we have a couple of questions about Lighty.io. Um, it was mentioned in the Zoom chat that Lighty.io is a replacement of SDNC. Um, does that mean we can think of Lighty.io as an open daylight packaging distribution for own app? And also, um, was it the enterprise edition that was used or was it a community edition? Okay. Uh, fully understood. So uh, yes, uh, yes. When when I said uh, that we are uh, replacing the DNC by the standard uh, uh, distribution, yes, it's true. We are using uh, the Lighty.io distribution of Open Delight. Okay, and we are only using uh, the community edition of Lighty.io. It's not uh, the specific enterprise uh, distribution. Uh, so uh, everything is uh, public, uh, open source. So we have also upstream the, the way to, to build the uh, Helm charts uh, from uh, Lighty.io like to be able to deploy it easily in the ONAP uh, framework. Everything is uh, available in the Lighty.io like public uh, GitLab. Great, thank you. Um, moving along, uh, was there any integration with server cloud infrastructure managers? Like uh, Cloud Cloudify, for example, no, we did not integrate with. Okay, uh, Mudasar, if you. Uh, if you want to clarify uh, what you're asking, feel free to type it in the chat, but we'll move on to the next question then. Um, did you use AAI as a single source of truth for inventory information and Cisco NSO databases for operational slash state info? Did you coordinate AAI and Cisco NSO DB? Um, yeah, so uh, in fact, uh, yes, uh, when I said, uh, AI, AI is the single source of truth. Yes, uh, in fact, we I should uh, say uh, AI uh, federates the different uh, sources of truth, but the root of the sources of truth is uh, into uh, AI. Of course, in AI, you will never have all the configuration details uh, that are in the router but only the parameters that are useful to generate this configuration. And in Cisco NSO, uh, you will have, of course, all the configuration uh, details because it's the scope of uh, Cisco NSO uh, to, to have this kind of information. And uh, in Cisco NSO, we are not storing uh, any operational data, only 
configuration uh, data. And to make the link between uh, the two, uh, it's based on the unique uh, identifier generated by the active and available inventory, or in fact generated by the SO and store in the active and available inventory. And we are mapping the service instances uh, configured by NSO with this uh, unique uh, identifiers in the NAI. And uh, just to give you an example, uh, if you want to track a service creation, for instance, in all uh, the, the system, so you have many components because you have ASO, you have active and available inventory, you have netbox, you have the CDS, you have open daylight or like the Otayo, you have um, uh, NSO. Uh, if you just you just filter your logs uh, according to the service ID generated uh, or stored in the active and available inventory, you will see uh, what happens in each component, and it's, it is also stored uh, in the in the NSO database. Wonderful, thank you. So uh, Mudasar has actually come back and provided some additional clarification on the previous question about integration with uh, server cloud infrastructure managers. Um, he was referring to Kubernetes or VMware as an example for element managers. The current deployment uh, is using Kubernetes and uh, it is orchestrated by uh, uh, Ansible playbooks. So if, if, if by server cloud manager, you, you mean something like Cloudify or other orchestration platforms that orchestrate uh, the installation of Kubernetes, right now we are using uh, Kubernetes, but uh, we are not using uh, management orchestration software like Cloudify or us. Great, thank you for that. Um, Dong is asking uh, what uh, I guess the end goal is uh, for Orange when it comes to ONAP, um, specifically so something like closed loop. Uh, is that on the radar? Oh, it's also a very good question. So uh, we are actively working on closed loops on other scenarios, uh, not for transport. Uh, we. But of course, uh, we are. We also want to implement closed loop for transport scenarios. Uh, but in fact, uh, as far as the transport um, networks are, are concerned, uh, if we want to talk about uh, closed loop, we will talk about telemetry. I'm not pretty. This is just a personal opinion. I'm not pretty convinced that the, the, the current DCI of ONAP is the best platform to manage uh, telemetry at scale, uh, but it's very good to have DCI for other use cases. So uh, it's at this stage, it's more uh, for our, our point of view, a lab topic rather than an operational topic, but it will be something uh, next year uh, we would have to, to, to work on because it's very important if we want to reach uh, a higher level of maturity in our automation transformation, of course, to have these closed loops and uh, to, to try to figure out how to integrate some telemetry tools with uh, the ONAP uh, ecosystem in the same way we have done it with, with Ansible playbooks and uh, Cisco and SO to manage the, the IP or configuration changes, for instance. But it's still an open question. Uh, yeah, these are all really wonderful questions. Thank you, everyone. Unfortunately, we are out of time uh, for today's session. As I mentioned, we have captured all of the questions and we are recording uh, the slides as well. So what we'll do is we'll uh, we'll take the questions that haven't been answered yet and uh, do some follow up um, to get that information out there. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Again, anyone who's registered will receive a link to today's recording along with the slides and the one pager that was just published. And we are working on a longer form case study that will be published soon as well. So thanks for joining us today, everyone. Have a good day. We'll see you soon on another webinar. Okay, thank All right. you. Bye. Thank you.